Good evening and welcome to Artist Talk on Art. It's Monday, February 28th, 2022. I'm Doug Shear, president of ATOA. Tonight's Zoom panel is Pandemic Spring 2020, NYU's first remote semester. Where are they now? This is a follow-up on the impact of the pandemic on these photographers at NYU, organized and moderated by the NYU professor and photographer, Lawrence Wheatman, and featuring photographers, Suzanne Muller, Jordan M. Smith, and Debbie Serzin. The panel examines how these photographers and their practice changed during the pandemic time. The panel, the panel's comment, the panelists' comments are theirs and not necessarily those of ATOA. You will have an opportunity to ask questions using the Zoom chat, which you'll find at the bottom of your screens at about an hour into the stream. Now I'm going to introduce Lawrence Wheatman, who will in turn introduce each panelist. T. Lawrence Wheatman was born and raised in Washington Heights in Upper Manhattan, New York City, and attended public schools. Although college bound, his trajectory changed upon being expelled from high school just three hours before graduation. This was the Vietnam era and apparently the organizational skills Wheatman employed to motivate students and faculty in anti-war and civil rights demonstrations were not appreciated by all. After hitchhiking for three years throughout North America, Wheatman returned to New York City and launched Cockroach Art, a 7,000 square foot performance space and coffee house across from the bitter end on Bleecker Street. The art, also known as The Roach, traversed new ground in combining expression as diverse as rock and ballet, stand-up comedy, and kinetic sculpture in the same space, and featured a number of known artists at the beginning and some at the end of their careers. Wheatman then performed with various bands of diverse musical genre in New York and Europe, and his all original rock and roll group, Madison Avenue, was produced by the late Felix Papillardi. The photographic experience came quite early to Wheatman in many evenings he remembers spending with his father in a makeshift darkroom at home. He first began to embrace the power of the camera's eye in video as a producer, director, talent, and camera operator for music, fashion, and commercial purposes. Gallery showings of his photographic work commenced in earnest in 1984. Besides his activities as an artist, Wheatman also does photo work in the more commercial aspects of the craft, including many magazine and music CD covers, and is a longtime professor of photography at New York University School of Professional Studies. He uses this reality of multiplicity to make his choice not to specialize. The result of this is that he utilizes broad aspects of camera, film, darkroom, brush, and computer. And now I'd like to turn things over to Lawrence. Thank you, Doug. And um, yeah, thank you so much. That, 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 that stuff sounds so familiar. It's almost like it's my story. Uh, <laughs> hey, Martha's here. Hi, how are you? And Larissa, hello. Um, yes, I. So what we're talking about here is is the spring semester of 2020, and of, of course, you know, we. Uh, I mean, NYU was amazing at uh, having us updated way before we were hearing anything on the news. And um, I happened to have had a significant other that was in the medical profession, and between the two of them, I was getting you know lots of information. But I, we still, I still. None, I think none of us were really prepared for what was about to happen. And lo and behold, by the time it was, uh, I think it was late March that the, uh, the course started and uh, here it was, we weren't going to be meeting in a classroom, we were going to meet, be meeting in, on Zoom. And so here we are again today, two years later. Um, that was an eight week course. 
And uh, the course normally include all, of, almost all the courses I'm teaching uh, in the last few years have uh, included a, uh, a, a, a show at the end of the semester, depending on which course we're talking about, either a solo show or a group show. And in the case of this one, it's the eight week versus the 10 week and the 12 week uh, courses, uh, which have different flavors to them, but uh, this was to be a group show. And indeed, what we did was a group show on um, on Zoom, and we had uh, hundreds of people that couldn't get in, <laughs> and a couple of hundred people that that were able to. And um, yeah, so I think the first thing I'm going to do is to show the results of that class. It's uh, uh, the three people that are here tonight, as well as two others. And so here we go.
I forgot there was music involved with that one. <laughs> um, so that's what we did after an eight week course or at the uh, before the end of the eighth week, actually on the seventh week. Um, and um, indeed, uh, just uh, you know, Debbie certainly had experience with uh, with this because this was, her, I think, her fifth time, uh, something like that, uh, that you had taken my, my, one of my classes. Yeah, you're nodding your head. I see that. <laughs> you're muted. You're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Think... Yeah, close to that. Yeah. Okay. And um, so that's uh, where we were uh, exactly uh, two years ago, or not exactly, a, a few months uh, in May, I think it was the end of May, uh, two years ago. And um, let's see, maybe I should see if there's any questions at this point. Oh, there's something in the chat. Um, okay, I'm not getting which other oh, it is. Uh, uh, oh, yes. Yes, so our old neighborhoods. Yes, indeed. Okay, very good. Um, fabulous. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to go on and uh, do share a screen again, and you're going to see the show from uh, this week, and all I have to do is find it. There it is. Uh, and on this one, uh, you're going to be seeing uh, something over 200 pictures. You're going to be seeing them four seconds at a time. I'll be pausing just to uh, introduce because all of the uh, works are uh, in here, including some that you just saw. Uh, but mostly, well, there's 200 pieces and there was far fewer in there. Um, so that's what you're going to be seeing. And yeah, exactly what I had talked about, eight week course. And um, we've continued to meet regularly ever since. So in other words, that eight week course is uh, uh, what, at a hundred weeks now or something like that. And um, I, it certainly was incredibly useful for my mental health to do that. So thank you for the participants and uh, that, uh, that, that did it with me. And um, we're going to be seeing Susanna's work first. And Susanna is originally from Switzerland, and she's residing in New York in Baja, Mexico. Poor girl. And, and she has to walk like, you know, 200 feet to get to the beach. Uh, and she speaks five languages, and she's traveled to 50 countries as a global executive coach employed by Swiss Airlines, Swiss Mission to the United Nations, Nestle, and most recently as a leadership coach. Susanna has shown her photography in New York and in inspirations around the globe in 2016, and virtually in pandemic spring 2020, which was oddly enough in 2020, and has been inspired by modern art, uh, various vibrant cultures and multiple and multiple vibrant color, colors and multiple cultures. She loves to explore and express her creativity with no limits. And aside from climbing Mount Kilimanjaro Kim and completing the full Ironman triathlon and many marathon races, she's a weekly blogger, a pod podcaster, and author of two books: "Take It from the Iron Woman" in 2017 and Lipstick Leadership 2021. And here's her self-portrait, and now I'm hitting play. And Susanna, if there's anything you wanna say about this, please feel sure. free. Well First, I'm humbled to be here. Thank you so much. And also inspired by many great artists and I'm happy to show my art here. And I love colors, as you can see, and just uh, out of the ordinary things, what you see around the house, and especially in the pandemic, when you live in the house, what do you see that you have already? No, obviously, obviously, food is, is something that's dear to my heart. And when you live in the kitchen and eat healthy food that's what's the motive of my subject are bananas i love a lot me too <laughs> and you have visitors sometimes and now uh, you're using a bunch of apps obviously to do do this or yeah, just a couple of apps or i'm i'm actually using my iphone when i uh, first started the class I, I admitted that I only have an iPhone and I use Snapseeds also to modify a little bit. 
I love Snapseed. For anybody who's not uh, has an iPhone or an iPad or even a, an Android, uh, Snapseed is a Google product and that's free and it's incredibly powerful, astonishingly so. Mm -hmm. Little clumsy to work with, but uh, uh, really quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. It's it's my number one go to for finishing my pictures. And as we probably have uh, some, I haven't checking time, but we have probably have some, another uh, uh, ten minutes to go and watching. Uh, uh, well, we have another two or three minutes to go with watching. Susanna's, if anybody has live questions, you can go ahead and just ask. Snap seeds, yeah. It's snap seeds. Oh, okay. I'm gonna I'm sorry, I'm stopping this here because I, I just wanted to say that uh, this, uh, you, you saw that she did Buddhas uh, uh, two years ago as well. Uh, this is an exp expanded version of that. And you're probably, because we're only seeing these for four seconds at a time, uh, you're probably going to be uh, saying, well, why is this, have, what does this have to do with Buddha? And if we stopped it and you, and you looked a little bit, then you would see. <laughs> Sometimes the Buddha is a little bit hidden or a lot hidden, I should say. So <clears throat> just wanted to say that. This is one and only that I have. So again, when you think about what you have in the house, use what you have. So we don't need to buy expensive uh, models or whatever mm. you you can just use what you have in the house bookshelves or tables and just add your imagination and colors Okay, whoops, I hit the right button. Stop. Ah. Okay, back, back, let's see. Okay, hopefully it's just going to stay here. I hope, I hope, I hope. All right, this is Jordan's come, work is coming up. And Jordan M. Smith grew up hunting rocks and hiking in the Black Hills of South Dakota, like the history guy. Uh, through his graduate studies in New York as an urban planner, he was trained to look more critically at urban design and appreciate the built environment and architecture as art. His interest in photography started as a way of depicting the relationship between the city inhabitants and its physical form, both of which are in a constant state of evolution, particularly in New York. As a photographer, the manner in which people react to the physical objects around them is a continuous source of surprise and intrigue, and Jordan tries to represent the city as a character, along with the people depicted in these pictures. Such interactions are generally depicted in an unposed, candid manner, which Jordan believes shows this relationship in the most authentic way. 
And I just want to add uh, just to or reiterate the, the part where he says, uh, appreciate the built environment and ar architecture as art, because then you would, that just makes it uh, clearer what's going on here. Yeah, so, you know, as Lawrence mentioned, so, you know, I signed up for the course as a street photography and in the early days of the pandemic, not wanting to go outside, you know, you're forced to do more indoors. And so once, you know, things started improving, I got back outside and, um, yeah, I mean, I'm really inter interested in, in street photography and, and capturing moments that were never meant to be captured, you know, and then giving them life forever, which is kind of a fascinating concept. So. I'm always just out looking for anything that looks, I guess, cinematic or interesting. Um, in other words, it's just a way to get out of my apartment after a busy day at work and kind of de-stress. So, um, you know, one of the things I realized in a lot of these pictures, and maybe I didn't do it intentionally, but there are a lot of people smoking cigarettes. And at first I thought, well, that's strange. I didn't really intend that. But I think in the end, what, what it was, was that you know, when people are smoking, their masks are down. And so when I was taking pictures, you know, it, it, during the pandemic, you know, the people who were smoking weren't wearing their masks, so you could see their faces. And so maybe I was kind of drawn to that, um, like this guy smoking. smoking. And this one. <laughs> and this one. Also smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Not a smoker myself, but, you know. Nobody's smoking here. He's looking for a smoke. Um, yeah, but as mentioned in the bio, you know, I love New York. I live in New York City. I love it here. And um, there was a quote, I think it was maybe Joel Meyerowitz or um, Bruce Gilden, who said, if you can smell the street, then it's street photography. So <laughs> some of these, I feel like you can sort of smell it. Um, yeah. This is the Joan of Arc painting in uh, the Met. Smoking wearing uh, latex gloves. So obviously he's concerned about, you know, not catching COVID, but he's still smoking. <laughs> okay, whoops. Ah. Uh, you know what, I think it's that I have to be in the app for these commands to work. All right, well, let's stop it there. Okay, yay, it stopped. Okay, Debbie Sertskin. Uh, oh, wait a minute, no, there's one before this. Oh, uh, uh, Debbie's artwork, uh, I've somehow loosely sorted into categories without identifying bumpers, with identif without identifying bumpers. So that it's loosely sorted into the categories of collage, portraits, self-portraits, fantasy, scenic, Halloween, flora, still life, and not necessarily in that order. With the first grouping being in the category of what she did in the past three days. I, I'm not sure I got that correct, but uh, it's ones that she submitted late last night. Uh, so that's what the, after having submitted uh, every single day for the last several <laughs> weeks. <laughs> uh, so let's see now, I, but I think I missed your bio. Uh -huh. Yeah, there we go. All right. My chat is in the way. Sorry. Okay. Oh, it's in the way too. Ah, okay, there we go. Uh, for Debbie's. Ah, ah. Mm. There we go. Uh, for Debbie Sarskin, due to a deep interest from childhood in painting, drawing, and fashion, Debbie enrolled into herself into Parsons School of Design, the New School, and the Barbizon Institute of Fashion Merchandising, leading to a work career as a fashion buyer. In 2013, she added photography into her toolbox via one of my courses at uh, NYU, Beginning Photographer to Exhibiting Artist, that's the 12-week, uh, showing her artwork having previously been long a desired yet greatly feared activity. And yet she's been a repeat student and a powerful guest presenter many times since. Successfully utilizing fun as fuel, 
I just made that up. Uh, with strong suits in the whimsical, ethereal, theatrical genres, Debbie is amongst the most prolific artists I've ever known. This is absolutely true. She was from the very first uh, uh, course that she took with me and has regularly been featured at, uh, a featured artist at her local galleries and libraries as a lifelong New Jersey resident and in the two solo and many group showings there. And um, oh, uh, let me see if I can stop it here. I just want to talk about this because I just found out uh, from reading uh, something that she sent me last night, uh, right, reading it today, that she's uh, essentially sold this as a commercial piece to the um, to the restaurant. They saw the picture and they bought it. And so uh, I, I think that's so hip and cool. And uh, she's yeah, making what, two of them. They bought one for their home and one for the restaurant. But in that, if uh, if it's for the restaurant, then that's for a commercial piece commercial yeah. purpose yeah okay let's see if clicking that button makes it run again yes if you want to speak with uh, debbie and just to ex if, explain if anything or anything this, this was ice on the window that i was just the last snowstorm this was in my in the house during COVID when i was locked in the lake down the street from me i did a lot of these in my backyard and in the lake down the street. And I have, as you know, a love for mannequins. And these are some of my mannequins pictures. That's my mannequin, Penelope. And I had a lot of fun with her during COVID. And I take it she's a full-size girl? No, she's only a torso. But it's fun. I mean, she's sitting on top of a china closet now. But there's a lot of great wooded areas around here. And that was in Washington. And I took that from the car with a cell phone. This I took with a cell phone. And that with a cell phone also. And there's Penelope on top of the china closet. I love what you said, uh, Jordan, today, uh, that Pen Penelope has to be part of part of this. Yeah, <laughs> well, Jordan's the one who got me interested in it when he was talking about a mannequin or something across the street from him during COVID. And I had Penelope and I actually sat her in my kitchen window for a while. She's an, she's an honorary member of this of this group, as far as I'm concerned. Please, I would do your Thank friend. You, Jordan. <laughs> Martha, I'm not talking too much, am I? No. <laughs> and these are just different flowers and leaves that are just outside the bush in front of the house. And I didn't get out much in those, what, 18 months we were locked down. And I was just around my neighborhood taking a lot of pictures, a lot of pictures out my window. That was out freehold gallery out the window into the town just they would get fresh flowers every week and when I was volunteering up there on the weekends I would just take pictures that's in Washington Square Park there was a couple and then I kind of edited it out made it I like these fantasy pictures that's Penelope and that was a moon that I have in the house but I played with it and these masks I took at a store and then I just edited them. And that I called Madame Corona.
That's your buddy, Lawrence Mary. These, yeah, those two that just passed, uh, I found interesting just because one was the digital file and the other was uh, the framed piece. Right. I collaborated with a friend on that one. I had a lot of beer steins that were left me from my aunt at the house and I inherited it. And he took pictures of them and I said, no, we've got to play with them more. And we both worked on it. And that's that pretty whole gallery right now. That was a real woman walking down the street and I took a shot of her out the window. That's out my window. And some of these I had left in what, uh, what were obviously the beginnings of work uh, you, you that uh, and put them together with uh, ones that show the final work. I think this one is one of them. Yeah, this was the latest snowstorm we had this year. And I said I was going to take the, these two out, but I, I liked them too much. <laughs> I thought the sky was awesome in this one, so I had to get that. I love this. Actually, I love all of these. Thank you. That's the lake by my house, uh, Lake Carajo Cell. I'm in Lakewood, New Jersey, and I'm not far from the lake um, by Georgian Court College. And is like a lot, it's a great park there. And I get a lot of great scenery shots from there. And I, I see I did wind up putting in doubles. So sorry. <laughs> Some of these make me laugh. And I love it. Now, some like this, so these, this one and the past one, uh, where did you get those original images? I have different books and magazines and I'll find all pictures and I'll just scan them into the computer and use them. When in a pandemic, you got to resort to all kinds of things. And a lot of these, um, like the one you just passed, those are mannequins when, when I had, I still have them on my computer. Um, I took a lot of pictures of mannequins. That was um, right after the pandemic. And the first time I came back to Manhattan and this guy was outside collecting money and I saw that. Okay. There we have it. And I just want to leave this up for everybody to know that uh, ATOA lives by a shoestring. I, um, I uh, have known about them for certainly 30, actually, and I think it's more like 40 years. I, I don't know when you first started doing video, but I know that uh, uh, there were times where that my roommate Flash uh, uh, couldn't make it. And uh, so he sent me down and I never hung out. I never talked to anybody. I, I was uh, 
uh, the, the, the talk just seemed to be, uh, oh, these guys are all artists and I'm not an artist, even though I'd uh, been recording by that point uh, quite a bit. And, you know, before I, this was in the seventies, I wasn't a photographer, even though I grew up with photography in the house, my dad being an advanced amateur, uh, but um, I was a musician and I switched to photography in about 82 uh, or so. Um, and um, I think ATOA is an incredibly wonderful organization. And so if you can, you don't have to, but if you can, <laughs> please do help, help them out and help them stay alive and, and do more of these things. And I'm going to quit the share now. And so we can have a conversation. Who wants to pipe in? Let me check the chat and see if there's any, any questions here. Mitch has the hand up. Who? Mitch. Mitch. Oh, OK, there you are. Go ahead, Mitch. Uh, <clears throat> Debbie, are you yeah. there? Yes, I'm here. So when I was looking, as far as uh, doing the post for ATOA today, I was looking for your Instagram handle, but there are a few of <clears throat> by your name. Do you have an Instagram handle? Just Debbie Sarazen, D-E-B-B-Y. Okay. D-E-B-B-Y, okay. Yes. All right, sorry, I would have tagged you. Um, so um, you have a website also? Um, no, I don't, but I have a Facebook page for photography, um, Fine Art Photography by Debbie Sarazen. Great. So talk to me about your editing. I use different, I will on the phone, I'll use Snapseed, uh, Lightroom. Um, what is it about Lawrence? I'm going to forget it. Tangle FX. Correct. And on my computer, I'll use um, Smart Photo Editor and GIMP sometimes. Mm. GIMP. Wow. Fabulous. Uh, for those who don't know, GIMP is like Photoshop, but it's free. And it's been around for a very, very long time. And they're constantly updating it. Uh, I mean, I, I, you can get it for free and you can also pay for it too. I don't think there's a distinction between the two. It's just a matter of if you're using it, it makes sense to pay for it. But it's an it's a open software um, product. It took me a while to get to learn it. But once I got the hang of it, it was fun. So last question. <clears throat> so um, you've been studying under Lawrence for a couple of years now? It's been nine years this wow. June. Wow. So where has he taken you as far as, you know, collaboration, uh, advice? How has he opened up your range as a artist photographer? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> he paid us. <laughs> no, I was really, I was very nervous. And he really just, I don't know what he did, but he opened me up and I just took off from there. I, I was very comfortable for my first day in class with him. And I, he just did something that made me open up and not be afraid. I was really scared and self-conscious that, oh, nobody's gonna look at this. This is gonna be stupid. But, and then he told us different like alternative galleries. I learned a lot off of him and I didn't realize how much I learned off of him. And a street photography class, which I was scared to death about, I, it took right off after that. I was, it was great. You're very talented. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I've noticed some other people here that I have to say hello to. First of all, I've already did say hello to Larissa, but uh, I, I'm hoping you're going to, uh, to pipe into this and perhaps even answer that same question. And Mary Ellen, hi. Mary Ellen is here. Uh, we lost touch with each other for about 55 years. Uh, the very first girl I ever kissed. Hi, <laughs> and you are, and she is uh, uh, an extraordinary artist by, uh, all by herself. I, I, uh, since we've connected, I've seen so many of her works. So I just wanted to do a shout out to her. Who else has got a question? Or Larissa, you want to say something? Oh, I think I'm uh, running with Debbie for the record of the person that took your class the most times. I think so too. <laughs> and Larissa's also been my assistant on multiple occasions. Oh, and Doug, you met Larissa. Yes. Uh, 
so I have, a, I have a comment or a question or whatever. So there's a tradition in analog photography of putting filters over lenses and in, in one way or another, uh, creating changes with the original taking of the picture. And then of course, in the dark room, doing other things, dodging, you know, doing various things, uh, superimpositions and so forth. So a lot of these uh, students of yours are clearly doing most of the changes uh, in the computer when they're back at home or in their studios uh, and less things in the, in the camera or in the phone in some cases. So I'm curious to hear from them uh, what they think the ratio is between the kind of apps they're using in their phone or in their camera if it accommodates apps uh, compared with those that they're using on the computer. In other words, what we would have in the past called post-production. Any comments about that? You know, I'll just say for my part, um, my pictures are taken with a camera and uh, edited on the computer using Lightroom. Um, I haven't gotten into phone editing with um, any of the apps. I just do uh, generally just Lightroom. Right. Well, what, I, what I mean is there are apps that you can use in a phone, those, those who are working with iPhone or, or Samsung or whatever, um, so that when you're capturing right in the beginning, you're doing so with an app that's overlaying it, whether it's producing, you know, painting like effects uh, or distortions or whatever. <clears throat> and, and or you could be doing that on a computer, clearly. But I'm wondering how many people, so you don't do that in the field. You're taking straight shots. What about the others? Are they, are they doing some of it at least in the phone? Or yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what I do is I walk around, I see things that I like and I take pictures. And then some of the pictures are on top of each other. So I do everything on the iPad or on the phone and I do not, choose a filter before I take a picture. So I use the natural light and then I modify later on. Uh -huh. okay. I do about the same like you, Susan. Like the restaurant, the first one, I was sitting at a restaurant across the street outdoors during COVID. And I just snapped that picture and then I went home. And as I say, I played with it and I brought it to the gallery. I showed it to the owner and he said, oh, let me call the restaurant. And he said, when I came back, it wasn't even hanging. They had bought it already. He said, oh, and by the way, they want another one for their house, a bigger one. I was like, oh my God. So, <laughs> but it was great. Um, and the mannequins, I just take pictures of them all over and then I go home and edit them and put them in different places. And during COVID, I couldn't do that. I couldn't go out. I was stuck here. So I had Penelope to play with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my friend for 18 months, I guess. <laughs> And in answering Doug's question, I'll I'll do it as uh, as as somebody who puts out work as well. Um, I I came from the darkroom. I mean, I that was where I was first started uh, doing stuff. And I, I you know in, in talking about it's been more recent. I think it started well when I first heard about it, it was I guess about three four years ago about uh, people talking about oh that you know anything you do to to a picture mm -hmm. after it comes out of the camera it should just be straight out of the camera you shouldn't be doing anything to it and that I mean that never was true with film we always had to do something with it um, I mean unless it was a, a photojournalism where it sort of didn't matter because uh, the only thing that matters in photojournalism is the speed you can get it out of the camera and onto the press um, but in every other case it in, was inevitable that you uh, in making a print no matter how much you might have cleaned the film uh, in between the time you cleaned it and you got it into the enlarger then inevitably there would be a piece of dust on it you would not see that in the darkroom you would not even see it after the print, uh, print came out of the uh, out of the soup out of the out of the developers um, uh, you would only see it after the, the print was dry that's the only time you would see that tiny little white dot or three white dots and then you take out a brush with some special stuff called a spot tone spot tone uh, which was a, a a set you could buy it in three bottles uh seven bottles or 11 bottles each bottle being a different color of black 
and uh, you would uh, thin it out and uh, you'd get to work with a, a tiny brush, a triple O brush, as I recall, which just had like three hairs on it. And uh, you take out those little little white spots. While you were there, mines will get that uh, gum wrapper off the floor. And so we were always having to work on our pictures, even when they were intended to be exactly like they came out of the camera. It was just fixing the problems that happened in the camera and perhaps on the floor with the gum wrapper. Um, but in the darkroom, I also, uh, you know, through the use of drugs and stuff, I also uh, wanted to play more. And so I would take the film and like Doug was saying, layer uh, two, two pieces of film on top of each other. Or um, if not that, then um, uh, twisting the film or letting it droop down into uh, into the the enlarger so that um, it would get essentially an effect that you might get on a uh, on a um, tilt shift uh, lens or a tilt shift camera or a view camera um, and uh, doing things in the darkroom um, uh, either with prints or with the negatives to intentionally destroy them to intentionally uh, mess them up or sometimes unintentionally uh, one of my favorite uh, portraits was I, uh, I did one of a fellow by the name of uh, Chris. Uh, it's escaping me now, but he was a, um, a, a child uh, a TV star on a, on a soap opera for, uh, well, until he stopped being a child. And then he switched to becoming a musician. And when he did, um, he, um, I knew him at, uh, I, uh, just from around the village. Uh, uh, and um, um he came to me for headshots and uh, something happened. It's the only time it ever happened, but I, uh, ac it ac I accidentally washed the film with water that was too hot. And so the film crinkled up. It, uh, it was a, there's a word for it, reticulated. And um, I um, was, so, was so disappointed. So I called him up. I, I did make some prints because I loved the effect, but it wasn't, I knew it wasn't what he wanted because he needed a straight headshot. And um I uh, called him up and I said, listen, you got to come over. I'm sorry, I have to redo it. I had a problem in the darkroom and he comes over and I had made a handful of 11 by 14 prints for myself because I loved it. And I said, S look what happened. And he said, I love them. <laughs> this is incredible. And that's what he wound up using. And that I never did that again. I could have. But lo and behold, it was by playing in the darkroom and playing with the chemicals and sometimes just intentionally splashing chemicals onto prints or ripping them up and then uh, uh, putting them back to, you know, pasting them back together and then re-photographing. And uh, I did a whole series of that called Broken Glass that uh, 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 um, was my single most successful show ever. I, I, I had done 48 pieces where I... Um, um, oh boy, it's a, such a long story. I'll make, make it as quick as possible. But that where I had all these torn up uh, um, prints that I would throw into the corner. And as uh, they often, I would be tearing them up when they came out of the soup. In other words, I made a terrible mistake. And this was during a time I was doing lots of printing and lots of color printing as well in, the, in my own dark room. And uh, so these, uh, these torn up pieces wound up in the corner. And at some point I go to throw them away and they had, as a result of the chemicals on them and uh, perhaps the, 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 light, the light altering them because some of them I was tearing up before they were even uh, uh, fully uh, developed or fully fixed. Um, and uh, I wound up uh, making uh, this, pro oh, I was putting together another show entirely. And it was the, my very first time uh, framing because uh, I did most of my own, almost all of my own framing. And it was my first time framing 30 by 40s and using glass. And here it was, I had this box of glass um, that was the box, it's weighed uh, probably 100 pounds. And obviously it was full of glass and uh, <laughs> I was as careful as I could be. And when I took out the first piece, long story, it shattered in my hands, it, uh, even though there was no real reason for it to shatter in my hands. And it was like the adrenaline of that experience uh, gave me, uh, it, it coalesced a whole bunch of ideas I had for doing uh, shows. I should say that this was during a time when I was uh, creating 
there was a three or five year period of time where I was creating seven new shows every year, as well as showing previous shows. So that there was, especially uh, there was one season where we had a number of um, weather events and uh, so that the uh, the opening would be postponed for three days. And then all of a sudden I'm going to two of my own openings in the same night um, and, um, you know, things like that. And uh, that Broken Glass series, uh, I created it by, I took all that Broken Glass and I cut it into pieces just like, I think it was, I don't remember the exact size, but like, let's say three and a half by four and a half. Uh, and I cut that, I did that size simply because I had uh, been walking through um, uh, the square around uh, A Street, uh, the St. Mark's Place, uh, where that revolving uh, cube was. Uh, I can't remember the name. Uh, 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 anyway, you know what I'm talking about, hopefully. And um, there was somebody there selling things. And one of the things he was selling was a big box of, of um, mats cut that size. Um, and uh, I, th I think it was 100 mats in, in, in this box and it was like $5 or something. And they were probably 30 or 50 years old. They were all yellow already. I love that. I, I love working with old materials. And uh, so I brought that, had that home already for a couple of years when this came up and it was like, wow, I can cut these into pieces like this. And then I took a uh, tub basin, uh, you know, plastic, uh, you know, like a wash basin. And I um, uh, filled it with water and I took um, uh, film, cartridge, film cartridges like this and I filled them with quarters and put it at the bottom, put four of them at the bottom and put the piece of glass down on top of it. And uh, I had found already that the, the picture you're looking at, you know, you're holding that weight in your hand, but 99% of that weight or more is not the picture, it's the paper backing. And that by soaking the prints, almost every single type, not every type of, uh, of print material, but, uh, uh, and we're talking, you know, film, uh, you know, chemical print material, uh, almost every single type of material, if I soaked it for a while, I could get my thumbnail underneath the emulsion and pull that off and float it in the water underneath the glass and then just put it in place, little, little pieces often. Uh, put it into place on the glass underneath the, uh, the water. And I'd keep doing that until I got something that I liked. And uh, then I'd take it out, put it into a telephone book and put it on the radiator. It took uh, two weeks for, uh, for it to dry on the radiator. And I had a finished piece. And um, uh, that series was just the originals, just about this big. And of course, since I knew there was one of a kind, I uh, documented them. And the documentation came out so well that I wound up a couple of years later making uh, 20, by, uh, 20 by 28 inch prints of those, that documentation of those pieces, those little pieces. And between those two shows, I wound up, uh, that was a, a tremendously successful, both financially and uh, you know, people talking about it. The, the second show, the first show I had of the large pieces, I called that a Broken Glass Revisited. I sold, uh, there were 48 pieces total, of uh, different uh, images, and I sold 44 of them in the first night that the show was open. Um, that was wonderful. It really felt great. And uh, coming into the digital world, I was an early adoptee of digital, not digital cameras because they didn't really get good until about 2005. Uh, the, 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 I had had a couple along the way that were horrible. <laughs> I mean, they were just so bad in the early 2000s. But in 1995, I had gone into what we then called analog, uh, analog capture. So shooting on film, it goes to the lab, getting processed the normal way, and then is without being cut, is put through a machine that made uh, 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 digital images out of it so that I had JPEGs, not film. And that uh, for commercial purposes was incredibly good. I was doing a lot of wedding photography uh, as a result of that. And it just made it so much easier than having to work with the film. Um, uh, actually, I take it back with the wedding photography. I just realized, no, the wedding photography, it was not easier. I thought it was going to be easier, but for everything else, for the commercial work, it was so much easier. And um, uh, uh, my use, I didn't, and I'm, I'm teaching from, I'm, I'm really a, a, the, the teacher's student because when it comes to 
doing the work that, like you just saw, it wasn't my invention. It was a fellow by the name of Dan Burkholder. And um, he spoke with me here, I guess it was about five or six years ago at ATOA. Uh, we did a panel uh, then all about iPhoneography, a, a word that as far as I know, he invented <laughs> uh, because he was the very first that I heard of it. Uh, I had already had an iPhone for a couple of years, or maybe even more, without ever taking a picture with it. And uh, he got one and um, he coming up with that whole thing, um, he loved the idea of being able to take a picture and then uh, using apps to alter that picture and then posting it. Uh, I don't think even Facebook was on yet, but maybe it was, but I, I forget where he was posting first. It might've been to Instagram. I have, I, I, at this moment, can't recall if, that, if it was either one of those. Uh, and what he loved about that whole process was that he would then be walking away from the thing he just took a picture of and already more people saw the picture than if it was in a gallery for a month. And it's only 15 minutes later. And the power of just him talking about that uh, was overwhelming to me. And I, from there, started using my phone a lot more. And uh, I have a cabinet full of mostly film cameras that something in the area of $50,000 worth, perhaps. And I've got uh, a, a, a bucket full of uh, digital cameras, including very, very, very good digital cameras. But I love using my phone. <laughs> it is so incredibly useful. And uh, frankly, there's uh, aspects of using the phone that uh, makes it far more useful than, than, uh, than, uh, than carrying around a heavy bloody camera. And then being able to utilize the apps, in, primarily on iPad is what I'm working on when I'm doing it because my eyesight isn't good enough to be able to use the phone. Uh, I go from there. Okay, Doug, yes. So I'm really curious, you know, uh, this has been a good panel to, to show us what went through, what went on with the students during the pandemic. So, very, you know, very interesting what their explorations were. So now I'm curious, as the pandemic is lifting and they're going, all of us are going to be out and about much more, perhaps traveling more, uh, at least hopefully if we're not facing Armageddon anytime soon. And, uh, you know, what's going through their minds uh, in the post-pandemic period? What are they planning to do with their photography, their art, uh, as they emerge from the, you know, from the, uh, from the hiding out stage? I'd like to do more street photography. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get back out into Manhattan and start doing more street photography. Yeah, same with me. I just, uh, I did not do well photographing inside. I mean, I produced some interesting work, but for me, I was just, I'm more interested in going out, seeing people's faces, documenting, you know, everyday street life in the city. So that's good to be out and doing that more. Mm -hmm. I think what has helped all of us that we met once a month, so, Sometimes you take a photography class and then you're like, oh, I'm done. And you don't produce any photographies anymore. But since we said we meet every month and Debbie has so many pictures, I think I can only speak for me and Jordan. We also kind of like forced ourselves to produce more. So I think it's, I mean, I'm not a, I've seen many artists of you and the ATOA who are, this is their full-time job. Photography is not my full-time job, but if you if it's a hobby and you can do it on the side, it's a lot of fun. And Debbie always used the word play. So for me, it's also playing. I think it's about playing a little bit and it's about just, I think, it having is. fun and play and the colors and, and try out new things. And I think through most of you artists, I got more curious to do more and, and got more courageous to do maybe something crazy. I, uh, I don't know if you get the lens scratch, uh, Doug, but I uh, got, it, got it today. It comes, I, I think, every day. 
And uh, there was a quote in there by the artist that they were featuring. Uh, her name is uh, Kathy Cohn. Uh, she's a, a photographer and painter based in East Topsham, Vermont. And she says, I make photographs as a way to listen to my heart song. And then I practice like hell to sing it. Huh. That's a blog, Lens Scratch? Um, it's, uh, I, I, it might be a blog as well, but I just get it as an email. I'm not, I'm not into blogs. I, 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 I spend too much time <laughs> ready on the machine. I'm trying to avoid finding new ways to get addicted to something. <laughs> so, so um, Lawrence, I think, I think I'm going to use this as a moment to thank everybody, starting with you. Uh, the peripatetic uh, instructor. That peripatetic, you have to tell me what that means, otherwise I'm going to be- Well, wondering. I mean, you know, bouncing along, so to speak, you know, yes. um, uh, who has really given a lot to a lot of people. So I, I applaud you. And uh, I thank you very much for organizing this event. Uh, and I want to also thank, of course, the three, the three presenters, Suzanne, Jordan, and Debbie. Uh, I'd also like to thank our programming committee, coordinated by Kristen Eichenberg and other volunteers and interns, including Maruna Stratton and Natalia Dragnea, handling Zoom and YouTube, Emily Villarreal and Catherine Carrillo, who handle the website and the social media, and Abby Herman, who handles our archives, as, as well as what I like to say is our intrepid board of, of directors. I'll call your attention that next week, the 7th, uh, we have a panel called Negotiating the Art World Now, which features two well, very well thought of advisors to artists. You know, you've heard about art advisors that advise collectors. These two, two women, Marina Granger and Audra Lambert, are very, very high powered advisors to artists and uh, not to be missed. And that's being moderated by one of our board members, Peter Duan. And I'd like to thank everybody who joined us tonight and wish you a good night. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Thank you all. And thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, thank Lawrence. Lawrence. Thank you.